All to the north, the rain had dragged black tendrils down from the thunderclouds, like tracings of lamp black fallen in a beaker, and in the night they could hear the drum of rain miles away on the prairie. They ascended through a rocky pass, and lightning shaped out the distant shivering mountains, and lightning rang the stones about, and tufts of blue fire clung to the horses like incandescent elementals that would not be driven off. Soft smelter lights advanced upon the metal of the harness. Lights ran blue and liquid on the barrels of the guns. Mad jack hares started and checked in the blue glare, and high among those clanging crags, joking rohawks crouched on their feathers, or cracked a yellow eye at the thunder underfoot. They rode for days through the rain, and they rode through rain and hail and rain again. In that gray storm light they crossed the flooded plain, with the footed shapes of the horses reflected in the water among clouds and mountains, and the riders slumped forward, and rightly skeptic of the shimmering cities on the distant shore of that sea whereon they trod miraculous. They climbed up through rolling grasslands where small birds shied away chittering down the wind, and a buzzard labored up from among bones with wings that went whoop, 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 like a child's toy swung on a string and in the long red sunset the sheets of water on the plain below them lay like tide pools of primal blood. They passed through a highland meadow carpeted with wild flowers, acres of golden groundsel and zinnia and deep purple gentian and wild vines of blue morning glory and a vast plain of varied small blooms reaching onward like a gingham print to the farthest serried rimlands, blue with haze, and the adamantine ranges rising out of nothing like the backs of sea beasts in the Devonian dawn. It was raining again, and they rode slouched under slickers, hacked from greasy half-cured hides, and so cowed in these primitive skins before the gray and driving rain they looked like wardens of some dim sect set forth to proselytize among the very beasts of the land. The country before them lay clouded and dark, they rode through the long twilight, and the sun set, and no moon rose. And to the west, the mountains shuddered again and again in clattering frames, and burned to final darkness, and the rain hissed in the blind night land. They went up through the foothills among pine trees and barren rock, and they went up through juniper and spruce, and the rare great aloes, and the rising stalks of the yuccas, with their pale blooms silent and unearthly among the evergreens. They descended by rocky switchbacks and across the beds of streams where small trout stood on their pale fins and studied the noses of the drinking horses. Sheets of mist that smelled and tasted of metal rose out of the gorge and crossed over them and moved on through the woods. They nudged the horses through the ford and down the trace and at three o'clock in the afternoon in a thin and drizzling rain they rode into the old stone town of Jesus Maria. In the morning the rain had stopped and they appeared in the streets, tattered, stinking, ornamented with human parts like cannibals. They carried the huge pistols stuck in their belts, and the vile skins they wore were deeply stained with blood and smoke and gun black. The sun was out and the old women on their knees with bucket and rag, washing the stones before the shop doors, turned and looked after them, and shopkeepers setting out their wares nodded them a wary good morning. They were a strange clientele among such commerce. They stood blinking before the doorways where finches hung in small withy cages and green and brassy parrots that stood on one foot and croaked uneasily. There were ristras of dried fruit and peppers and clusters of tinware that hung like chimes. And there were hogskins filled with pulque that swung from the beams like bloated swine in a knacker's yard. They sent for cups. The fiddler appeared and crouched on a stone door sill and began to saw out some Moorish folk tune, and none who passed on their morning errands could take their eyes from those pale and rancid giants. By dark the streets were filled with besotted bedlamites, lurching and cursing and ringing the church bells with pistol balls in a godless chivalry until the priest emerged bearing before him the crucified Christ and exhorting them with fragments of Latin in a sing-song chant. The man was drubbed in the street and prodded obscenely, and they flung gold coins at him as he lay clutching his image. 
When he rose, he disdained to take up the coins until some small boys ran out to gather them and then he ordered them brought to him while the barbarians whooped and drank him a toast. They moved on. There were eagles and other birds in the valley and many deer and there were wild orchids and brakes of bamboo. The river here was sizable and it swept past enormous boulders and waterfalls fell everywhere out of the high tangled jungle. The judge had taken to riding ahead with one of the Delawares and he carried his rifle loaded with the small hard seeds of the nopal fruit and in the evening he would dress expertly the colorful birds he'd shot, rubbing the skins with gunpowder and stuffing them with balls of dried grass and packing them away in his wallets. He pressed the leaves of trees and plants into his book and he stalked tiptoe the mountain butterflies with his shirt outheld in both hands, speaking to them in a low whisper, no curious study himself. Toadvine sat watching him as he made his notations in the ledger, holding the book toward the fire for the light, and he asked him what was his purpose in all this. The judge's quill ceased at scratching. He looked at Toadvine, then he continued to write again. Toadvine spat into the fire. The judge wrote on, and then he folded the ledger shut and laid it to one side and pressed his hands together and passed them down over his nose and mouth and placed them palm down on his knees. Whatever exists, he said, whatever in creation exists without my knowledge exists without my consent. He looked about at the dark forest in which they were bivouacked. He nodded toward the specimens he'd collected. These anonymous creatures, he said, may seem little or nothing in the world, yet the smallest crumb can devour us, any smallest thing beneath yon rock out of men's knowing. Only nature can enslave man, and only when the existence of each last entity is routed out and made to stand naked before him will he be properly suzerain of the earth. What's a suzerain? A keeper, a keeper or overlord. Why not say keeper then? because he is a special kind of keeper. A suzerain rules even when there are other rulers. His authority countermands local judgments. Toadvine spat. The judge placed his hands on the ground. He looked at his inquisitor. This is my claim, he said, and yet everywhere upon it are pockets of autonomous life. Autonomous. In order for it to be mine, nothing must be permitted to occur upon it save by my dispensation. Toadvine sat with his boots crossed before the fire. No man can acquaint himself with everything on this earth, he said. The judge tilted his great head. The man who believes that the secrets of the world are forever hidden lives in mystery and fear. Superstition will drag him down. The rain will erode the deeds of his life. But that man who sets himself the task of singling out the thread of order from the tapestry or by the decision alone have taken charge of the world, and it is only by such taking charge that he will effect a way to dictate the terms of his own fate. I don't see what that has to do with catching birds. The freedom of birds is an insult to me. I'd have them all in zoos. That would be a hell of a zoo. The judge smiled. Yes, he said, even so. They trotted half the length of the town before they had drawn about them a following of rabble unmatched for variety and sordidness by any they had yet encountered. Beggars and proctors of beggars, and whores and pimps, and vendors and filthy children, and whole deputations of the blind and the maimed and the importunate, all crying out por Dios, and some who rode astride the backs of porters and hide them after, and great numbers of folk of every age and condition who were merely curious. Females of domestic reputation lounged upon the balconies they passed with faces gotten up in indigo and almagre, gaudy as the rumps of apes, and they peered from behind their fans with a kind of lurid coyness like transvestites in a madhouse. 